If we uh, would all grab our seats and open up our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. I love the sound of fellowship. Blesses my soul, I tell you. So awesome. (coughs) Excuse my cough. I'll try to keep it from getting too bad through the teaching. But it's the smoke. Beautiful smoke. It, I don't know. Last year was the worst. And this year doesn't seem as bad, but it sure feels just as bad. So. But anyway, uh, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to go ahead and read uh, from 7 to 13. But we'll be focusing more on 10 to 13 because it's the second half of our study from last week. So um, let's go ahead and read and then we'll pray again. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you for this letter in particular to this church because it is speaking to our church today. And God, we pray that we would have open ears to hear and that we would not only listen, but we would be doers of the word. God, we give you glory and praise this morning. Inhabit the praises of your people as you did earlier but also speak to us by your word that we would leave here changed and transformed knowing that we had an encounter with you. We thank you, Lord, and give you glory and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're in the book of Revelation and we're in the second part of the three outline, which was says, write the things which you saw, the things which are, And the things which will happen after these things. And we know that was chapter 1 verse 19 that speaks of the outline. And of course the things that he saw was the glorified resurrected Christ in chapter 1. The things that are are the church age. Chapters 2 and 3. And then of course after we get to the end of chapter 3 and get into chapter 4. We'll see the things that are after these things. What things? The things of the church. The church age. We see seven churches that we've been looking at. And all seven of these churches form a circle. And uh, Sir William Ramsey, the, the, archaeolo- the archaeologist that went and studied these seven churches and actually wrote a commentary on these seven churches and these seven letters, discovered that this was an ancient postal route that went in the exact direction that these letters are written. And noticed that, with, that the order of these letters provide us much more than just seven letters to seven literal churches at their time but church letters to the churches of all time. And they speak prophetically of churches throughout church history. And we have looked at that. And we saw last time as we began our study in the Church of Philadelphia that this represented the missionary church from 1700 to 1900 where great works of missionaries went out and changed, basically turned the world upside down with little strength. People like William Carey that were uh, uneducated shoemakers that went out and brought the gospel to India and translated the Bible into languages that the natives could understand. And we just saw this great missionary movement that happened in those two centuries that were unlike anything except for the time of the apostles. And so uh, it was an amazing thing. And 
it, the Church of Philadelphia really speaks of the faithful church even up to today. And we saw, when we looked at the last four churches, when we saw that um, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicean, all four of those churches actually exist all the way up to the time of the rapture of the church in the Great Tribulation period. Some of them would go into the Great Tribulation period and some of them would not. And we're looking at one that would not. And that's what we're really going to look at today. But let's remind ourselves what we looked at last time about this church. This was one of the churches that had no, um, no um, rebuke from the Lord. It, them and, them and um, Smyrna were the only two churches that had nothing wrong to s- said about them. And we saw that in verse 8 that it said, Jesus said of the church in Philadelphia, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. The church of Philadelphia had this open door that no one could shut because they kept his word and did not deny his name. And really, that's the basis of all churches throughout church history. Those that keep the word of God, not just hear it, not just know it, not just you know, have an intellectual relationship with the word, but keep it in your heart. Remember that David said, your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. There's much more to to keeping God's word than just knowing it. And you don't deny his name. You continue to confess Jesus even in opposition. And so this church was, did that and did it with the right motives, not like, um, the church in Ephesus that did everything right, but they just left their first love. Here was a church that, that loved people so much that even in opposition were willing to share the gospel. And that's why they represent the missionary movement. But we see that because this church did these things, um, we're going to be looking more at the prophetic part of this letter as described in verse 10. Verse 10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Remember that these letters were not only for the church at that time and in, in the place, but also for all churches in all times. They have a fourfold meeting. Remember we talked about that? They, were, they, were, they had a, a, a local application They had an ecclesiastical, you know, application meeting to all churches at all times. They have a personal application to you and I personally, and they have a prophetic application for church history throughout all time. And we know that this, verse 10, is speaking of another place in time as Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia, was never kept from a trial that came upon the whole earth. The first part of this verse, because you have kept my command to persevere, uh, is the idea of bearing up under his word. There's a play on words here between the because you have kept, I will also keep you. It's, it's, a, it's a back and forth that Jesus is saying, because you've done this, I'm going to do that. And um, it, it means that they were keeping his word under the pressures of opposition and not letting up. It doesn't mean they were perfectly following the Ten Commandments. That's not what this means. It means that they were standing true to God even in their failures. Even no matter, you know, even in their imperfections, they weren't turning away from Jesus. They were standing for him and his word. This is referring to verse 8 where it says, I have set before you an open door. They had little strength. They had kept his word and they have not denied his name. That's what that's referring to. Because you have done that, and kept my command to persevere. Um, and the, it, the way the sentence is constructed in the original, it says, since you are keeping my word, I will keep you from. That's the idea here, that you're enduring under it. You're keeping it under even the pressure of temptation from the world and the, the satanic opposition that's around you and your own personal flesh. You're keeping the word. And so... Uh, But it says that I will keep you from. Notice it says, I also will keep you from. And that word from is a Greek word called ek. And it means to keep out of. Um, Greek prepositions are extremely um, inflective more than our English language. 
We can say from, and we could mean a lot of different things by that. But, but the Greek, you know, Greek prepositions, uh, the, the way they would teach them, the way they teach them in Greek class is you have a circle and you have the subject in the middle. And the subject is us being kept out of, and it would literally mean that you're being, with an arrow pointing out, is ek. You're being taken out of the circle, which is the hour and the trial, and you're the subject in the middle, the dot. And so that's the way that it worked. Um, there are some that say um, that this is to, that what this word means and what Jesus meant when he said this was he would keep you through it, that you would endure through tri- the trial and tribulation, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it, from what I understand, and I'm not saying this with direct authority, but from people that I trust greatly, that it has been used in many places in classical Greek where this word preposition is used in this sentence structure to always mean to keep out of or to remove from. So to, you know, there are those that will argue um, our, our biblical premillennial pre-tribulation view by saying that things don't mean what they say when they say what they mean. So um, just to, just to kind of let you know that. But the idea is then if this word ek is being used and the Lord says he is keeping us from something, what is he keeping us from? But there are two definite articles that are used in this verse. And they mean the hour and the trial that is coming upon the, the whole world to t- test those who dwell on the earth. Now, we're going to see this is going to be completely described in chapter 6 through 19 when we get into Revelation 6 through 19 as we see judgment coming upon a world that has rejected Christ and that judgment is coming upon those that are called earth dwellers be be aware of that word because you won't see the church mentioned again after chapter 3 until chapter 19 when Jesus they're coming when we're coming back with Jesus to rule and reign from the earth the judgment is coming upon the earth of those that are dwelling on the earth So the idea here is that we are being kept from the hour and the trial that isn't just coming like daily tribulation and trouble that we have as believers, but an actual hour and trial that is coming upon the whole earth. Now, Jesus mentions this in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, verses 21 through 22, it says, For then there will be great tribulations such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. So Jesus described this time that we call the tribulation period or the hour and the trial. This is one of the most descriptive verses for what we call the rapture of the church. Where it says, you know, since you're keeping my word... Since you're a born-again Christian, you put your faith and trust in me, and you're continuing to put your faith and trust in me up to the time that I come, since you have kept my word in this church, prophetically speaking of the time before the rapture of the church, I am going to keep you from, what? The hour and trial coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth those that have rejected jesus christ the earth dwellers we will see those later on so that's what the rapture of the it is a descriptive verse also it shows a pre-tribulation viewpoint pre-tribulational viewpoint but what does the bible teach that's what we were here we are into the bible Uh, we want to make sure that all of our doctrine comes from the bible and so we want to make sure we do, we go by what the Bible says. Is this a biblical doctrine? So let's look and see. First, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the rapture? Maybe to some people, that's a, a, a new viewpoint. It's found several places in scripture, but the most important one, the most important place, and you should uh, earmark it in your Bible if you're curious, memorize it if you're smart you know if you read it enough times you'll know it and that's first thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 now the the context of first thessalonians of course paul was writing to the church in thessalonica because um it was just to let you know that first thessalonians is probably one of the earliest letters like galatians and first thessalonians are probably two of the earliest letters written in the new testament meaning that the epistles. Um, 
Paul went to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey, and he was only there for three weeks. It says that he had reasoned for three Sabbaths, and then the Jews rose up and brought persecution upon uh, people there, and it caused Paul to have to leave. And so he left, and then he gets word from Thessalonica that there was some, you know, still some questions swirling around the church. And one of them had to do with those that got saved when Paul was there, but had died since the point that, you know, people were coming in and telling him, hey, your loved ones died and missed out on the resurrection. And so that would be kind of a bummer, wouldn't it? And so they were curious about that. Paul, wanting, worried about the church, had spoke in length and taught them about things that were going to happen in the last days, wanted to clarify what he meant by those that had passed that would pass away in Christ. So in verse 13, Paul would say, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or had died in Christ. Um, this, of course, is saying, I just don't want you to be unaware. You guys are curious about this. I want to I want to clear it up for you right now, um, because I don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope. You know, people in the world, when somebody passes away, um, is a sad thing. You really don't know where they're at, right? If they're not believers, we know where they're probably going to go at, but we don't know what their heart is. So it, we can sorrow because we don't know. But we, as Christians, and those that are believers, um, our loved ones that will die in Christ, we know where they go. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to sorrow like the unbelievers do when people die because they don't really know. And so... We are not to sorrow as those who have no hope. And in verse 14, it says, For if we believe, if you and I believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus or have died in Christ. And it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. So this is not something that Paul just you know, came up on his own. This is something that the Lord had taught Paul and had taught, and we'll see that here in a minute. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Remember that word. You should underline that word, caught up, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul wanted to remind them that, hey, they didn't miss out. They didn't, they did, they're not, it's not like they're in some, put on a shelf somewhere. They didn't miss out on the, on the resurrection. That there's coming a point in time at this moment where we're caught up together, where we will, they will rise first and then we'll be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. This is what we call the rapture of the church. Caught up. And it says, there are those who say the word rapture is not in the Bible. So there is no such thing as a rapture. So that's, there are people that will say that. You get on YouTube, you know, people that are post-trib, mid-tribs, you know, what a trib, whatever they are, they'll come out and they'll try to say, oh, there's no rapture in the Bible. And there's, there's people that say that, you know, it's not in the Bible. Well, I hate to break the news to them, to anybody who would say that, that there are no English words in the Bible. We have what's a translation of the Bible. And so they, they, the, the Bible's written in Greek. It's not written in English. And so when we start to pick and choose at saying, hey, well, the rapture's not mentioned in the Bible. Well, it is because the, it's a, and really it's a silly argument and not worthy of your time. If people say that there is no rapture. The Greek word for caught up is a Greek, it's, it's called herpazo. That's the name of the word. And, it, and in the Latin, in the Latin vulcate, it's translated rapturo. 
And that's where we get the English word for rapture, being caught up in something. You know, they, they talk about, she was, I was raptured in her beauty, meaning I was caught up in it. So it's just an English word of how we, you know, describe the Greek word for being caught up. And it means to take by force. And it is used, remember in the book of Acts, when Philip went and, um, you know, was told to go down to, you know, the south where there was desert. And uh, after there was a big revival in Samaria, and of course, Philip being uh, the kind of guy that he is, he said, yes, Lord. And even though he didn't question the Lord, he ran down there and he was to go and overtake a chariot of an Ethiopian eunuch. And of course, we know the story. He jumps in and, you know, shares the gospel with the Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian says, well, what should I do? You know, and he says, well, you, if you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. And he, they found some water and Philip baptized him. And when they came out of the water, guess what? Philip was caught up, caught away to Azotus. And that is the same word. He was taken away. The Lord took him and put him, transported him someplace else. So in context and in the word, it's exactly what it means. Rapture, being caught up, taken out of the earth. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's going to happen. It is something that is told in the Bible. Paul was telling this church it will happen. And it might happen in your lifetime to be prepared for it. We also see it mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. 50 through 52. Now we know Corinthians was a corrective letter by Paul to a church that was uh, having a lot of troubles. And of course, there was people in there that were debating and arguing over the resurrection and what kind of bodies we would be. And some were saying there was no resurrection at all. And Paul was saying, hey, if there's, if Christ is not risen, then we're men of most, we're the men to be pitied because we're believing that we only have hope in Christ in this life only. And if we thought about that, If our hope was only in the life that we're living right now, that's not much hope at all. But the hope in the resurrection is. But when he gets all the way down to verse 50, he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, meaning our physical bodies that are dwelling in this sinful shell that we're still struggling with, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. And here he explains it in 51, says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, uh, when you see that in the Bible in the New Testament, it's not something that's mysterious that we can't really figure out. No, what the word mystery in the original language means, this is something that was hidden that is now being revealed as a truth. It's no longer a mystery. It's been solved, basically. Here is something that you're concerned about, don't really know about, but here, now you know. And it says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning not all of us are going to die. Some of us are going to be alive when the Lord returns. But we shall all be changed. That word changed is metamorphosed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Metamorphosed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to happen. Just like that. And Paul is saying to this to this church that this could happen at any moment. It could happen today. And Jesus, he did allude to this, by the way, to the rapture of the church. And it could be that when we see the language that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 4, that when Jesus mentioned in John, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Now notice... Paul said, I didn't want you to sorrow like others who have no hope. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, he's on his way to the cross. This is after the Last Supper. They are sorrowful because he keeps telling them that he's going to be arrested and killed. And he wanted them to not be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He says, so he says, if you believe, uh, Paul says that, Uh, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Jesus would say, if you believe in God, believe also in me. So almost the same language, Paul's saying it a little differently, but we almost think that this could be what Paul was referring to. Because he goes on to say in verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. That means dwelling places, guys. That doesn't mean, you know, a castle up on a hill. 
It's dwelling places, places where um, there are enough for everybody to have a place in heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But notice he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you, those that were alive. He was talking to the, the, the future church, the disciples, that if, he goes, he goes, if I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So this is talking about, Jesus is talking about a time when he was going to come and get believers and take them to the Father's house to be with Jesus. We have to ask ourselves, when is that? And we will come back to it in a minute to uh, this, um, what Jesus said here, because there's some great stuff here that we'll talk about in a minute. But now that we see in the Bible that there is a rapture, the next question is, when is it? Because, and, and, I, and I'm telling you, I don't, I don't really, people that say there is no rapture and uh, they don't want to, you know, they don't even want to talk about it. I, I don't even really want to spend any time with those people, you know, because they, they, they're obviously not taking the Bible literally. They're not taking the Bible seriously because we just read and it says in plain English and it's even plainer in the original language that there is a rapture. There, Jesus is coming to take the church to be with him at a moment of time. And the word is used to be snatched away. It's used throughout the scripture to take away by force. To, you know, Philip was transported immediately. Enoch was transported into heaven immediately. It's used. And so we, but the idea is, is the timing of the rapture. Now there is, you know, we can have a debate with that, but we have to answer a few questions before we, um, before we can come to what position we hold. And there is, there, this is where much debate comes in. I never, but, you, but never allow the debate to be what shapes your views, but only scripture. Make sure that, you know, there's a lot of great YouTube debates between Thomas Ice and this person and, you know, Ed Heinsohn and another person and you can find these things, but never let that be what shapes your view. Always be let scripture be what shapes your view. But we know that G, we must hold a view that aligns with scripture and not man. Always. Every doctrine that you hold, you should be able to back up with scripture. If you can't, then it's not a true doctrine. You're just, that, that could be a tradition. It could be something passed down. It could be an opinion. But if we have a doctrine, it needs to align with scripture. And we know that Jesus was pretty clear that no one knows the day or the hour of his return. Was he referring to the rapture or to his second coming? That's the question. Let's look at a couple. Now in Matthew chapter 24, in verses 36 through 51, we see that this is after Jesus is describing what the seven-year tribulation period will look like. He's already mentioned the abomination of desolation, which will happen at the midpoint of the tribulation period. And then he changes the subject because he's writing to the, the, these, the people that are asking him this question are the apostles. And they're the ones that are going to go out and start the church in the book of Acts. And so... He changes the subject and he says in verse 36, but, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Speaking of the day and the hour. Well, the, the day and the hour, and when that term is used, is speaking of a, 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 a time period. And that time period will be further examined and we're going to look at it in length between 6 and 19 of the book of Revelation. That's the time period. It is known as the day of the Lord or the hour of his return. And so we see that, but of that time period, the time when the tribulation starts, nobody knows. Nobody knows but the Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so will also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. The idea here is that they didn't really, they didn't take it seriously. You know, you know, we know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but they continued living on and didn't think nothing of it until it started raining and water started rising. 
then all of a sudden, uh-oh, uh, it came, right? And it's the same thing that's going to happen when the tribulation period comes upon the earth. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two men, women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Now a lot of people will tell you that this is only talking about the second coming and saying that the ones that are being taken are taken away for, from judgment. But that doesn't line up with scripture. Because we will see, and we are mentioned in verse 10 here of Revelation, that it's coming to t test those who dwell on the earth. Judgment is coming upon those on the earth, not those that get taken away. They're not being taken away for judgment. They're being judged here. Jesus comes back and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and it splits in half. And he destroys all of the armies at the Battle of Armageddon. And we come back with him. And that is the judgment. The judgment happens then on the earth, not taken away from the earth. So when you read these things, you have to make sure they line up with all the rest of your scriptures. And we know that the, the, the judgment's going to happen here on the planet during the tribulation period. So who are those that are taken away? And if you read Luke 17, you'll read that it, we talked about this a few weeks ago, that it is probably most likely those that are being taken away before the judgment comes. Because it says to, uh, uh, and, but because he says in verse 42, watch therefore, you guys that are still alive, that are going out and preaching the gospel, that are part of the church in the book of Acts, you guys are to watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And then he goes on and he gives us a parable in verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping, oops, excuse me, weeping and gnashing of teeth. The original question was about his second coming. A thing the Jews understood See, the Jews, um, they thought that Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come and set up his kingdom on the earth right then. That there was no, they, they, the, to them the mystery was the church age, the dispensation we live in. To them they didn't understand that. All they understood was the promises that the 27% of prophecy that's in the Old Testament that hasn't been fulfilled yet, they, that's what they thought was going to be filled immediately. And that's why they kept wanting to make Jesus king. They thought Jesus, when he rode in on his tri triumphant entry into Jerusalem, that he was going to make himself king, break off the powers of Rome, and rule and reign the world from Jerusalem, just like the prophets had foretold. But that's not what Jesus had planned, and they did not understand it. Um, uh, Jesus explains to them what the signs of that time would be like, but they purposely changed the subject uh, but then personally changes the subject and, and gets personal. That's the idea. And, and the, the change in subject in Matthew 24 and 25 is him getting back and getting personal application to those that are asking the question. Because it happens again in Acts chapter 1, right before the ascension. Jesus has been with the disciples 40 days and 40 nights and then he would, he would, on, you know, the day of Pentecost, when it fully came, uh, the church was, you know, brought, brought to life after his ascension. It says in Luke chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, I mean, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Jesus, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? It was an honest question. Are you going to set up the millennial kingdom now? Is that what you're going to do? And Jesus said to him, said to, and, they, and Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know times 
or seasons which the Father has put into his own authority. No one knows the day or the hour. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So Jesus told them that, hey, I'm coming again. You don't know the day or the hour. That's not put into my authority. That's the Father. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. They had a commission, the great commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Guess what? That's still the calling of our church. That we are to tell people, hey, Jesus is coming again. Need to get right with the Lord now? You can because your sins are going to separate you from God. If you put your faith and trust in the finished work that Christ did on the cross for you and believe in your heart that he rose again from the dead, you will be saved and you will escape the wrath that is to come. And that's the gospel. We're supposed to go out and preach that. That's what they were told to do because Jesus is coming again. And don't just stand there and look up and go, wow, pretty cool. He's in the clouds. No, he's coming back in the clouds. And, you, every, and you're going to see it. You'll be part of that. But you need to go out and share the gospel. But they were not to know the day or the hour. <clears throat> we just saw in our scripture today that he was going to keep us from that hour, right? the hour and the trial that is coming upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We were to be kept away from that, kept out of it. So this means that the Bible is teaching what we call the doctrine of imminency. What's that, you say? This means it is a doctrine that is taught in churches like ours and what we believe the Bible teaches, that Jesus can return at any moment. So, and only, only a pre-tribulation rapture view can have this doctrine. Any other view, we can know the day or the hour by following the days, the days till Jesus' second coming in Daniel and Revelation. And we're going to cover those in depth when we get there. But if you are a mid-tribber, all you have to do is wait, you know, from the moment that the Antichrist signs a covenant, confirms a covenant with the nation of Israel, you can get out your calendar and start checking off days. And when you get to the three and a half year part, uh, and you'll have to, of course, get a Babylonian calendar, but, you know, but when you get there, that's a 30-day, 360-day calendar, you'll get to that day... And that'll be the day the Antichrist goes in and sets up an image and stops the sacrifice and declares himself to be God. If that's when you believe the rapture happens, then you'll be able to count the days. If you're a post-tribber at the end of the tribulation period, from the day of the abomination of desolation, when that happens, you can start, pull out your calendar, start counting days. And you'll know when you get there, oh, tomorrow's the day, you know. And so... But only a pre-trib view that believes that the rapture happens before the seven-year tribulation period can have the doctrine of intimacy, and we believe that's what the Bible teaches. We've just looked through many scriptures, and there's a thousand more. You can go and search day and hour. No one knows. Jesus says it over and over again. And so, but one of the most definitive verses that tells us that we will not be here For the great tribulation period is found in Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, at the end of the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus had told them about the the, the destruction of the temple that was going to come in 70 AD, and and, and then the future seven-year tribulation period with the abomination and desolation and all the things that are coming upon the earth. He ends the sermon by saying, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and cares of this life that that day what day capital d the day of the lord the seven year tribulation period the day of god's wrath come on you unexpectedly for it will come as a snare to all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth and we just read that in verse 10 in revelation same language therefore verse 36 watch therefore this is this is being written to you and i 
Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to what? Escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We're going to escape what things? The tribulation period. He just mentioned it. So there is a great escape. We are going to escape. There is a promise for you and I to escape God's wrath being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. He has just got done, and it says the warning is clear. He is coming soon, and we do not know the day or the hour. Now, I know you have heard the arguments. Matter of fact, there's a gentleman here that has an answer question thing on our local radio Christian station that tells people that he was brought up under Chuck Smith and only believed a pre-trib view because that was what he was taught. And, that, and he goes on to say, if you study the Bible, it's not in there. Really? We just read it. We just read it. You know, um, and a lot of these guys, there's a lot of these guys that you'll find online. And if you really dig deep into their websites and their person and who they are, they're, they're never usually connected with the church and they have no formal education. And they're just, they're just really self-proclaimed Bible answer people. And they're not really, you know, they haven't been educated under the people that we know that are solid teaching. So, and it, that just raises a red flag to me. If you're not connected to any church or any, any other thing, where, why, who, who's your accountability? You know, who's, who's the one that you're bouncing these things off with that can correct you if you're wrong? I want to be teachable, guys. That's why, you know, I, prefer, I like having Calvary pastors that watch our sermons and, and, and I talk to in length and they can come and say, you know what, but maybe you're, you're handling this, you know, maybe, have you ever looked at it this way? I want to be teachable. And when some people get on the radio and say for sure about something that's not for sure when you read in scripture and, you know, it just kind of, well, that's enough said about that. And um, he also tows, this guy on the radio also tows the line, then this, you probably heard this before, that, that the rapture view is just a new teaching that was brought about by a guy named Darby in the middle of the 19th century. But nothing could be further from the truth. What did the early church believe? Can we go back and, and f- discover from some of the early church fathers what they believed? Now, they didn't uh, have the exact same viewpoints like we do. Um, they weren't there to see Israel reborn in 1948. They're not there to see uh, the rise of a one world government and one world religion like we are today. But we do. We get to see those signs. But they, they had, you know, but they understood what the scripture said. Um, the first one I want to read, and I've got this off of um, some dissertations made by some famous people like Thomas Ice that I found online. You can actually go online in Liberty e- EDU and other places, and there was a lot of papers written on what the early church fathers believed about the rapture of the church. And so this one is quoted from a, a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, or Hermas, uh, this was written in the second century, and it speaks of a pre-tribulational concept of escaping the tribulation. This is, I'm just quoting from it, and uh, it says, You have escaped from great tribulation on account of your faith, and because you did not doubt in the presence of such a beast, go therefore and tell the elect, the Lord of elect of the Lord his mighty deeds and say to them that this beast probably one of the early emperors that they were facing under the persecution in the second century but it says and say to them that this beast is a type of the great tribulation that is coming if then ye prepare yourselves and repent with all your heart and turn to the Lord it will be possible for you to escape it what the great tribulation period That's what this says. If your heart be pure and spotless and you spend the rest of your days of your life in serving the Lord blamelessly. So this guy is obviously, he knows what the Bible teaches about the book of Revelation and what we just read and taught and believed that those of us that would be around when the Lord comes again before the tribulation period would escape it, the Christians. And then from the Didache, or it's called the Teaching of the Twelve, which was right around the second, third century. Uh, This is a little bit more wordy, but um, you could kind of get the point here. But it says, for in the last days, false prophets and corruptors shall be multiplied and and the sheep shall be turned into wolves and the love shall and love shall be turned into hate. 
For when lawlessness increases, they shall hate and persecute and betray one another, and then shall appear the world deceiver as son of God, the Antichrist, and shall do signs and wonders, and the earth shall be delivered into his hands, and he shall do iniquitous things which have never yet come to pass since the beginning. Then shall the creation of men come into the fire of trial, and many shall be made to stumble and shall perish. But they that endure in their faith shall be saved from under, from under the curse or under that curse itself. And then shall appear the signs of the truth. So the idea here is that those that are faithful up to that point will be saved from it. First, the sign of an outspreading of heaven, then the sign of the sound of the trumpet, and then third, the resurrection of the dead. Yet not all, but as it is said, the Lord shall come and all his saints with him, and then shall the world see the Lord coming upon the clouds of heaven. The world shall see it in the second coming. So it's kind of wordy, but it's in there. Um, but this one here is from Irenaeus, from his book, uh, against heresies. It's book 5, chapter 29. And of course, we know Irenaeus. I've talked about him before. He was a pupil of Polycarp, who was a pupil of the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation. And he said, and therefore, when in the end, the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, of course, he had just got done describing about what the great tribulation period would be, what shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, there shall be tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning, neither shall be, and he quotes Matthew twenty four twenty one. for this is the last contest of the righteous in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. Maybe they didn't quite understand the concept the way we do, but they understood what the Bible taught and believed. What about the apostles and the epistles? If they taught and believed that, that the Lord could come back at any moment and that those that were believers would be caught up and taken away before judgment came upon this earth for rejecting his son, what did the, and, and what did the disciples that wrote the epistles in the New Testament say about the coming of Jesus and about the doctrine of imminency? Well, of course, we know Paul, we just read, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, it says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So it couldn't be any more clear that those that got saved, what were they? They were waiting for his son. They weren't waiting for the Antichrist. They weren't waiting for the, the, the seven-year declaration with the children of Israel. They weren't waiting for the abomination of desolation. They were waiting for the return of Christ to come and save them from the definite article there is the wrath, meaning a particular wrath that was coming. It's a noun used in the original language. James, what about James, the half-brother of Jesus? He wrote an epistle. What did he say about the return of the Lord? Well, in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and later rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Couldn't be any more clear. He's encouraging the believers in James' day to be watchful and waiting for the return of the Lord. What about John? Of course, he wrote the book of Revelation and wrote what we're talking about. But in his general epistle in uh, 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to read verse John chapter 2, verse 28 to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, Jesus we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, the hope of the Lord's return, 
in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So John was expecting the Lord to return. What about Peter? Second Peter chapter two, chapter three, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And what, what is that day? Talking about the tribulation period in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, what's his promise? He's coming again to take us, to deliver us from that moment. Look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then what about Jude? Jude wrote a, wrote a short little epistle right before Revelation. Jude, it's one chapter in verses 20 through 21. He says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Why are we looking for it if we already have it? We're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Notice the theme here. Yes, they were all waiting for the Lord's return in their lifetime. They all were expecting it. And all through church history, those that believed in the Bible, that read it and believed in it, understood from Jesus and, the, and the, uh, all the epistles that were, were instructions for us to be expecting the Lord to return at any moment. Now, We notice that in the rest of, let's finish off, um, I mean, we are to wait with the same expectant, expectancy. I don't know, I can't pronounce that word. Expect, we're expecting him to come at any moment. Jesus says this of himself. Now, um, in verse 11, in chapter 3 of Revelation, it says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Remember we talked about that word quickly, it's the word tachometer. Like when we're in a car and it revs up and the RPMs get to a certain point, we have to shift into gear. When he's coming, it's going to be like the tachometer. The gears are going to shift faster and faster and then he'll return. The signs that are shifting. He's coming quickly, meaning that when he comes, it's going to happen like that. And he's saying to hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Remember, there is a crown of rejoicing for those that are waiting for the return of the Lord. Those that are, are expecting his return, Paul would talk about. But notice the promise for those that are waiting. He who overcomes, and we told you before, John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5 talks about, I think it's 4 and 5, tell you that he, who is he who overcomes, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. It's our faith that makes us an overcomer, not our works. So it's he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice the exhortation to be aware of his coming. And a promise, the promise is only will be granted in heaven. Those promises are not fulfilled here on earth. Those promises to this overcomer at this time was what's going to happen to us at the time when we go in the rapture of the church. Now let us go back for a moment and talk about what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. This is where Jesus said he was coming again, that he might gather us up together, that we might be with him. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. The language here makes a lot more sense if you have a little knowledge of some of the practices of the Jews back in that time. They would have perfectly understood what Jesus was referring to when he said these two sentences to them, particularly those of the Galileans. 
the apostles were all, the, the 12 that were with him, were all Galileans. They were from the Galilean area. They would have completely understood what he was talking to. And the language here would have them understand he was referring to a wedding. And more importantly, a Galilean wedding. There are many similarities and are better explained in the movie Before the Wrath, which I will have copies. Uh, We are going to be having a film night at probably my house, but we will talk more about that. I know I can't fit everybody in there, but I will have copies to go around. And, um, And it's from a friend of mine who created this movie that talks about the Galilean wedding and it's, it's very, very, very informative, and it will transform your view on how you see Jesus teaching out of John 14. And he says, but here are a few. Here are a few things that they would know when he mentioned this. First, in a Galilean wedding, in any Middle Eastern wedding, they had what was known as a betrothal period, which is like us, which is um, when we have an engagement, you know, we, we, we get an engagement ring, and basically we give the engagement ring to our bride-to-be, and that's the promise. She says yes, and now we're going to get married, right? Well, back then it was a little bit more serious, but there is a point in a Galilean wedding where the groom will go to the, to the, to the bride, the bride-to-be, and will offer her a glass of wine. And at that point, she can either refuse it or receive it. And if she receives it and takes a drink out of the glass, she is basically saying yes. And it's one of the most powerful points in the movie that point to our communion with the Lord. And it's just, there, it's, you can't even, it, it's so amazing. But there's the betrothal period. But during this betrothal period, the groom goes to the father's house to build onto the father's house a place for him and his wife to live. And of course, he will build on this house and the the groom has to continue to build on this house until the father gives him approval that it's done. So even the son doesn't know when the father is going to give him approval to build onto this house, but it's at the father's house where this groom is preparing a place for his bride. Are you starting to see the picture? Starting to color in there a little bit? And of course, then only the father knows the day and time of the wedding. It could be in the middle of the day, could be at night. Nobody knows the day or the hour of the wedding, only the father. And it's when the father, and they, the house could be done and the groom could be waiting, but it's not till the father decides this is the day. And he'll go in and he'll make an announcement to the father, go get your bride. It's time to go. And he'll have a groom's, he'll have a, 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 a party of people that will go to get the bride. And the announcement is made with the blowing of a trumpet. It's a shofar in those days. And they would go through the city blowing the trumpet, bringing this, um, it looks like a, you know, like they carry kings on. I forget the name of it, but it's, it's like a keturah or something like that, that they carry people on and, you know, people grab it and put it on their shoulders. And of course, they would take that through the city while they're blowing this trumpet and everybody would know that it was time for the wedding. The wedding was coming now. And of course, the procession is where the bride is taken up to the banquet. The bride is put onto this thing that is taken up on the shoulders of these people and the procession leaves town and guess where they go? To the father's house. The banquet is for seven days. And the wedding feast is at the father's house. And there's a million more pictures that they would have understood when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. They would understand that when he said in my father's house are many mansions that he's speaking of exactly what they would have understood for somebody for the bride and the bridegroom. They would have understood that that's what he meant. And there's a bunch more that would blow your mind, guys. I, I, that screams of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. There are so many shadows and pictures throughout the Old, Old Testament that would blow your mind if you go and look for them. Uh, we've already covered a couple on Wednesday night from Enoch being taken up before the flood comes upon the earth. Noah being a type of the Jews being carried through the flood like the Jews will through the tribulation period, those 144,000. But Enoch is in heaven during this time. And then, of course, we'll see uh, Lot being delivered from 
you know, um, the righteous being delivered from the judgment coming upon Sodom. Um, there's so many pictures of the rapture of the church in the Old Testament. We're going to see a really cool one when we get to Genesis 24. That really, if you didn't really know it and you see it, you're like, it, it, it's almost slaps you in the face when you see it. And it's amazing. You know, I, but I'll just say to you, do your own homework and trust what the scripture is saying. Don't take my word for it. Go back and study those scriptures that we mentioned. Go back and read them. See what Jesus meant when he said, no one he knows the day or the hour. And understand that, that you know, in Luke where it tells us that we're going to, to pray always that you'll be found worthy to escape the things. What things? The things that he was just talking about that we're studying in Revelation. And he said, but we're going to close today with what Paul had to say about our, re, us living today waiting for the return of the Lord. Because he says in Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age that we're living in. And what are we doing while we're living? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what you and I are to be doing, not looking for the Antichrist, not looking for the tribulation period, not looking for the mark of the beast. We're looking for our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that could appear at any moment. That is our blessed hope, guys. We have a blessed hope. It says in 14, he who gave, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Teach the rapture of the church. Exhort people that Jesus is coming again soon. Tell people that they're not going to get, if you can't, Give, if you can't give your life to Jesus now in this world, do you really think you're going to be able to do it when they hold a gun to your head? I don't think so. And so you need to do it now. And we need to exhort people to put their faith and trust in Christ because we have the blessed hope. It's not the blasted hope. We aren't, we aren't looking forward to being part of the time when Jesus Christ comes and judges this world. Why? Because they've rejected the gospel. They decided that they would rather have themselves be God. They're going to believe the lie and they're going to stop and, and God has to come and judge mankind. But I just want to give you the encouragement today since we, there's so much more we could cover on the rapture but we just don't really have time on a Sunday morning. There's plenty of good things out there but I'm telling you, don't take, you know, you can read books on it if you want but like I I wrestled with all those things as a brand new Christian. Pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. I knew there was a rapture. That was that any other argument, push aside. We, we know the scripture says there is. But I wrestled with that. And I prayed and read the scriptures. And the scriptures is what gave me the doctrine of intimacy and the fact that, that Jesus Christ is going to take his people away before the tribulation period. So before we pray and send you on your way. I just want to always encourage those that might be here or those watching online, if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, you need to today. There, there is no signs that need to be fulfilled before Le Jesus comes again. He can come at any moment, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we don't really get much of a chance after that. You know, you need to do it today. Don't be part of the great escape. And in order to be part of the great escape, you need to be one of his children. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. How do we become a child of God? John would say in John chapter 1 verse 14, For he came to his own and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, they were given the authority or the right to be called the children of God. So how do we receive Christ? We have to repent. We need to agree with God that we have sinned, that we have broken God's law, that we deserve judgment that's coming. But Lord, that, but we realize that Jesus Christ took upon himself the penalty that is due us for our sins. That when he died on a cross, he was taking upon himself the sinless 
Son of God coming on earth, died on a cross so that you and I could have life. He paid the penalty for our sins. And when we put our faith and trust in him, and we are revealed in scripture that God accepted that sacrifice on our behalf by rising Jesus from the dead. And he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. And you can simply do that by asking him to forgive your sins and inviting him into your life. And that, you know, I can lead you in a prayer, but it's more than just a prayer. It's you turning from your old life and putting your faith and trust in Christ. And that's why we call it a personal relationship with Jesus. It's what the decision you have to make. I can't make it for you. I can't make you do a ritual. I could get you up here and you could cry and get on your knees and pray. And and I'm not against that, but it's really your heart being turned to God and putting your faith and trust in him. And so with that said, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. God, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us by purifying your own special people, that we would be zealous for good works in these last days, that we would be living with an urgency that your return could be at any moment, that we would not be slack in doing the work of the kingdom, sharing the gospel with our loved ones and people that we know that are going to be um, stuck left on this earth for what we're going to read about soon in the book of Revelation is a time period that we wouldn't even want our worst enemy to be part of. God, that we would be diligent to make sure that we're sharing and planting the seeds of faith in people's life around us. And God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to not take this life so serious, Lord, that we'd have our hands so tight onto the things that we have on this earth that when you come again, we would be gripping things that are useless in eternity. And that we would have a light grip on this world, Lord, and, have our, and be having our minds in heaven where they need to be. And God, I pray for anybody that's watching online or maybe even here in this room that have never put their faith and trust in you. And God, I just pray that you would be working in their hearts. Lord, your Holy Spirit has come to lead people to you. And I pray that you would be doing that in their hearts right now. And if that's you and you would like to say a prayer, you could say a simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. God, I turn from them now. And I desire to put my faith and trust in you. Please forgive me of all those sins. And Lord, help me live for you the rest of my life. God, I pray for somebody that has a broken and contrite heart that's, been, that's calling out to you now that you would come into them and make your residence in them, that you would save them and that you would let them know by your Holy Spirit that they are born again. Not based upon a work they did, but on a spiritual work, a supernatural work of your Holy Spirit coming down upon them today. And God, as we just go our way today, we thank you for all your goodness and grace that you continue to pour out upon us. We give you glory and praise and thanksgiving in the name of Jesus, amen. So thank you, everybody. God bless you. I hope you have a good week. And um, we'll see you on Wednesday.